Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lund, and this is Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today our guest is X.J. Kennedy, a man who often describes himself as a writer of textbooks or a writer for children, rather than saying that he has had a profound effect on generations of readers. Yet the Poetry Society of America recently awarded him the Robert Frost Medal for Distinguished Lifetime Service to Poetry. X.J. Kennedy's influence dates back to 1961, when his debut collection of poems earned the Lamont Award of the Academy of American Poets. He has published seven more books of poems since then, and has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Los Angeles Book Award, and the Shelley Memorial Award, among others. X.J. Kennedy taught at some of the nation's best colleges, including Tufts University, Wellesley College, and the University of Michigan, before he decided to focus on writing poetry and textbooks. His texts are among the most popular and respected in the country, and his An Introduction to Poetry, now in its 13th edition, is the best-selling college poetry textbook. Yet XJ, which is the pen name for Joseph Kennedy, has also helped much younger students develop an appreciation for literature. He has written 18 books of poetry and fiction for children and has co-edited two anthologies for children, which have been bestsellers. XJ credits his wife, Dorothy, and their five children with helping him develop a style and a sense of humor that resonates with young readers. In all of his endeavors, XJ excelled because he had the courage to follow his own path and to ignore literary convention. When his contemporaries embraced free verse, for example, XJ kept using rhyme and meter. He ignored the trend toward obscurity, and he continued to employ humor and levity in his poems, even when some writers labeled his work light verse. This boldness sometimes goes unnoticed, however, because X.J. Kennedy is soft-spoken, gracious, and funny, as you will see in just a moment. I'm delighted to have him on the show. Joe, welcome. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, your introduction would be a hard act to follow. Oh, well, I don't know whether to say thank you or I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right, yeah. Well, why don't I take the pressure off by asking a very simple question before you read your first poem. I'm sure viewers are wondering, hmm, X.J. Kennedy, how did he get that from Joe Kennedy? Oh, well, if your name is Joe Kennedy when you're growing up, and uh, Joe Kennedy was an ambassador to England at the time, you know, old Joe, the father of the president, and Bobby. Oh, uh, well, I got kidded so much. I thought if ever I sent stuff out to try to print it, I would change my name any crazy way I could think of to be a little bit different from the famous Kennedys of Hyannisport. So I stuck the X on and got stuck with it ever since. Well, you are distinctive in your own right. You don't have to worry about that. Now, would you read a poem for us? Oh, gladly. This is called Nude Descending a Staircase, and uh, that is a, an unoriginal title. I, I swiped it, of course, from a famous painting by Marcel Duchamp, uh, just uh, trying to describe the figure coming down the stairs. Toe upon toe, a snowing flesh, a gold of lemon, root and rind, she sifts in sunlight down the stair with nothing on nor on her mind. We spy beneath the banister a constant thresh of thigh on thigh. Her lips imprint the swinging air that parts to let her parts go by. One woman waterfall, she wears her slow descent like a long cape and pausing on the final stair, collects her motions into shape. Mm. Very nice. 
As I was listening to that poem, I noticed two elements that really characterize your work. And the first is rhythm. There is a wonderful musicality to your work. And the second is a touch of humor. And I found myself smiling as I was listening to that poem and also thinking, oh, oh, oh this poem is so right. So I assume that you chose that poem to open our conversation because it reveal something about your work that you want people to understand. So what would that be? Well, I, I chose it because most people are interested in nudes. I thought that would be <laughs> one way in, but you know, yeah, it's a typical early poem, I guess, of, of, of my stuff. Uh, it, it rhymes and scans, and I hope it's sort of clear, and I don't know what else to say. <clears throat> well, the poem does all of those things. Good. Now, you and I chatted a couple of times before you came to the studio, and you were telling me about how you became interested in poetry as a child, and I wonder if you would share that story with viewers. Well, uh, I met poetry as a child early on, on my mother's knee. My mother uh, loved Mother Goose. And uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's Garden of Verses. I still think those are two of the greatest books you can give a kid, books of poetry, that is. <laughs> so uh, I picked up, uh, I guess, uh, uh, some of her love for the sound and the rhythm. And Mother Goose poems are so crazy, they're often nonsensical. and. Uh, because they are, you tend to remember them <laughs> rather than <laughs> if they made perfect sense. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's how it started. Mm. Now, what is it, do you think, about rhyme and craziness that really appeals to children? Because I get the sense that it's, it wasn't just you who love those things, but a lot of kids relate to those elements, even if they've never heard poetry before. Oh yeah, it's curious that rhyme is out of fashion among most American poets these days, although there are some who persist in it, but uh, it is such a primitive, basic thing with uh, the appeal to both sound and sense. Uh, and as for the craziness, well, you know, <laughs> kids, kids like nonsense uh, as a rule. And uh, uh, why, I don't know, but, but they do. Now tell us a little bit about how you started to write poetry, because it was not at all what I expected. Uh, well, my first poem, I, I was forced to write in third grade when the teacher made us write a Christmas or Hanukkah poem. And I, I, I did one. But I didn't really start to write in, in, a, in any kind of big way until I got in, in the Navy, where for four years I was a, a white hat during the uh, Korean emergency in the early 50s. And uh, my job was to go out on destroyers and write stories about the crew for their hometown newspapers and take pictures of them so I could do all my work the first two weeks of the cruise, then I had nothing much to do except keep out of the way of, of the people who were working. So I, I had a pad and a pencil and I started writing verse, uh, which of course I loved by then. And uh, so I wrote a lot of that uh, by the time I was discharged. When you were writing in the Navy, what were some of the things you wrote about? What were things that you wanted or needed to say at that point? Well, some of the poems were uh, about Navy life. We visited Greece and I, I wrote a poem about uh, sitting in uh, the, the theater of Dionysus in Athens and drawing Mickey Mouses for Greek kids on my pad and other things, and oh, <laughs> I wrote a lot of early poems then, and they were about everything under the sun. 
Now, I want to ask a little bit about what happened in your experience after you left the Navy, because you had a number of fascinating opportunities. And they eventually led to the first of what I would describe as very bold decisions on your part. So take us from the Navy to when you met Dorothy. Oh, well, OK, this will be a quick time travel trip. Uh, after the Navy, uh, I had the GI Bill, like uh, all veterans, and I could go to school any place. So I chose Paris. And I went to the Sorbonne for a year where I, I had to study French irregular verbs in order to stay in Paris, but it was worth it. And uh, then in Paris, I met a poet named Sid Corman who had uh, great influence. He, he had a magazine, a little mag called Origin. He was one of the first to publish Robert Creeley and Denise Levertov. And, some other fine poets. And Corman had been to the University of Michigan. So when I was, I decided I wanted to return to the States and go to grad school. And Corman said, well, go to, go to Ann Arbor, Michigan. They have a writing contest called the, the Hopwood Contest that, that pays big bucks. So maybe you, you might make some. So that's what I did. And I went to Michigan. I began work on the PhD in English. And the best thing about that was that Dorothy was also uh, trying to take the same degree. Uh, we were both dropouts, though she got farther along than, than I did. And uh, then uh, we got pregnant. Well, she did most of the work. And uh, uh, I had burnt my bridges. And I had told them at Michigan that I wouldn't go on with a PhD. I was getting very smug. I had a, this first book of poems came out. And I looked around and I saw all kinds of writers who were faking it through as, as writers without PhDs. So I said, I'm going to do that too. So uh, I dropped out of the PhD program and uh, uh, we ended up dropping out together. That I would describe as your first bold leap. Foolhardy, yeah. <laughs> How did you know it was the right thing to do? Well, I didn't, but I, but I wanted to do it. And Dorothy, who has always had more courage than, than I have, she, uh, she was all for it. And, and so uh, that's what we did. So you and Dorothy got married. We did. And you started a family. Yes. And you taught for many years? Uh, about 14, mm -hmm. yes. Mostly at Tufts with a few uh, visiting joints uh, in, in between. So you were a full professor. Finally, at, yeah. Yes. At the point where you decided, I don't want to teach anymore. I want to focus on my own poetry and on writing textbooks. And at that point, you had five children? Um, I think we did by then. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was something of a decision. Our our five kids all have the misfortune of being smart, and uh, Tufts would have paid for their college tuitions, but we we ended up having to pay for them ourselves. <laughs> but but. Uh, Thanks to the textbook revenues, finally it all worked out. So tell us a little bit about how you started to write textbooks and how that became such a big part of your life. Well, when I was teaching at, at Tufts, um, a man named Sylvan Barnett was, was my chairman, the, the guy who had hired me. And he was a consultant for Little Brown. And Little Brown wanted a introduction to poetry textbook. So Sylvan suggested me. And I took on this assignment thinking it would be an easy summer of hack work. But it turned out that, oh, it took three years of battling with this intractable manuscript. And uh, 
the publisher would send it out to be criticized by some top flight academics, one of whom, Maynard Mack, remarked that if Little Brown published this book, it would be a lasting disgrace to them. So oh, I was crushed. But Sylvan Barnett said, oh, well, I think Joe can pull it out of the fire. So uh, uh, he, he talked the publisher into having faith in me. Finally, the book came out. And, and thank God, it, it made good and has stuck around. So that, to me, seems like another risky decision to make, where you had this one bad experience. You finished the book, which I totally understand, but yet you decided, I'm going to keep doing this, and I'm going to give up a full professorship to do it. Well, I was sort of forced to a decision because uh, other textbooks had come along by then that I was doing, and Dorothy was helping. We were writing big instructor's manuals to go with the things. and. Um, it, it got to be a full-time job, just the textbooks. So I realized I'd either have to quit textbooks or quit teaching or quit sleeping. And once again, Dorothy bravely said, well, why don't you quit teaching and maybe, maybe you can write more for yourself. And it uh, turned out she was right. Mm. So after you left the security of that job and you had more time, to work on your own poems. How did your work start to change? Um, well, it's hard to remember back. Um, I don't think my work has ever changed much. I got in a rut early on, just writing as well as I can and rhyme and meter, and never got out of it, really. Just went along or tried to. Hmm, that sounds like an understatement to me, but it does lead to a question that probably a lot of people would have for you, and that is, why did you always stay with the rhyme and meter, even when so many poets were embracing free verse? Well, I love it, and I think that if you write in uh, rhyme, for instance, um, you have a tremendous support system going for you. Um, if you write a line and then you try to rhyme it with something, OK, the poem takes off uh, on its own feet. And uh, it, it, it develops uh, according to where the rhyme scheme le leads you. Uh, as uh, the poet Rolf Humphreys once remarked, rhyme can lead you to say much better things than you could think of all by yourself. So you're wrestling with something mysterious. Uh, uh, it's, it's not as if uh, you, know, you, you, you know exactly what you're going to say. Often uh, the rhyme scheme won't let you. Mm -hmm. When I've been teaching poetry, if you can teach poetry, how, poetry writers, <laughs> uh, I have urged uh, students to try writing in rhyme just to see what it's like. And some of them have come up to me and said, ah, I can't stand this rhyme. It won't let me say what I want to say. And, and I tell them, yes, that's the big advantage. It won't let you express all those nice little clever thoughts that you think would be a great thing to write a poem about. Mm -hmm. It leads you, you don't know where. And uh, uh, some of them uh, find that it, it does that. Others, others uh, they, they can't get with it. But I think uh, God designs poets either to write in rhyme and meter or in free verse. And you've got to do what, what, what the Lord tells you. <laughs> That's uh -huh. good advice. <clears throat> now, when you and I were talking beforehand, you made some wonderful comments about writing poetry. And I'm trying to remember exactly how you said it. You talked about writing a good poem being very much like a happy accident or mm -hmm. like grace. And you also said that the poet has to have enough energy to extend a hand toward lightning. I think that's how you put it. Yeah, I guess I was echoing uh, uh, Randall Jarrell, who said that uh, while 
to write a, a good poem is like being struck by lightning. You have no control over it. Yet, uh, uh, it's like uh, the, the, the great uh, portrait of Adam uh, on uh, the Sistine ceiling. Michelangelo shows Adam extending a finger to receive the divine spark from God. And Jarrell says, so uh, you have to extend at least a languid finger in order to get the spark. Mm -hmm. Very nicely put. Another way of saying it would be you have to keep writing. You have to write and hope uh, the lightning will strike you while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Humor is a consistent element in your work. And a lot of poets can't pull off a humorous poem. It either sounds forced or flat, but with you, it seems very natural. Is that something that you have to work at, or are you just one of the poets that God meant to be humorous? Oh, Lord, you can't work at being funny. It, 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 you know, you <laughs> I don't know. You just do it if you feel like it. So you have done a lot of writing for children, which seems like another bold thing to do because so many writers don't consider poetry for children to be real poetry. Mm -hmm. But yet you have had some wonderful experiences where kids have come up to you at readings and they have thanked you for what you have done. Would you tell us one of those stories? Well, that's, that's so. Uh, I was reading poems and swapping poems with kids in a school in New Hampshire a while ago. And uh, at the end of the session, a young lady, perhaps eight years old, came up and said, well, you know, I'm a poet too. And she looked me in the eye drilling me and I said, oh, I didn't know what to say for me. I said, oh, and what kind of a poet are you? And she said, I'm a great poet. And I thought, oh, wow, if we all had such confidence. <laughs> so you never know from kids what reaction you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And I think you told me a story about another child who came up to you and said, in so many words that you had really given him permission to read poetry and to write it for himself. Uh, I can't place that kid in memory offhand, but uh, I know there have been some kids who have generously said things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And as you said earlier, there is something primitive about rhyme and meter. And yet that's what so many people respond to in poetry, whether they're mm -hmm. children or adults. There is a very basic connection that a lot of other art forms just don't have. Yeah, that's, 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 that's how I would see it. Um, when uh, I, I was starting to write for kids uh, and had a couple of books out, I would be invited into schools to meet kids. And one of the things that wowed me about writing for children was that these kids had no prejudices. They, they did not care uh, about literary fashion. Uh, at the time, in the early 60s, uh, rhyme and meter were going out of fashion in a big way. If you sent a sonnet to a magazine, it would come back like a boomerang. And Dorothy and I uh, started a little magazine called Countermeasures, which would print nothing but poems that rhymed uh, or, or scanned. And uh, uh, that, that uh, lasted for three years. And uh, it, it was... Uh, I guess this, this love of rhyme and, and rhythm that the kids showed that made me feel they were well worth writing for. Hmm. Well, we are almost out of time, so I would love to have you come back so that we can continue this conversation. 
and I would also like you to close with the poem. Oh, gladly. I'll have to reach down on the floor and find my drop book. One second. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, this poem hasn't been in a book yet. This just came out in a, a magazine. It's a poem about uh, a trip to Africa. Dorothy and I were in Mali, West Africa, a desperately poor country, and saw tourists, uh, our fellow travelers, uh, snapping pictures with digital cameras. And the contrast between these poor kids and these rich tourists uh, struck me in this poem. Tourist snapping pictures of children in Mali. In a dust-cluttered back street of Bamako, the tourist halts, collects a yelping pack by granting them an instant picture show. Behold their faces in his camera's back. Whooping, they crowd in, overjoyed to spot a crony framed in liquid crystal display, a naked little sister. It's their lot to live unphotographed. Until this day, when a vacationing wizard from the sky brings them a glowing screen in which to peer, an instrument beyond their means to buy, whose cost might feed a family for a year. A chill besets the tourist. Now he feels his hands upon his pentax clamp like locks, lest it be stolen. Now he blithely steals away these children in his light tight box. Mm, what a great image and a great ending to both the poem and to our conversation. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs>